Would you like to seriously speak on Mick just for a second? Yeah, the, uh, the band The Spiders and Mars. That was the whole situation that sort of got me uh, the kind of fame that I, I, I had in the early 70s. And the lead guitarist with that band was uh, Mick Ronson. And unfortunately, yeah. And Mick... Tragically, he, he um, succumbed to cancer uh, three or four days ago. Um, and his, in his passing, it, uh, I, I want to say that of all the early 70s guitar players, Mick was probably one of the most influential and profound, and, and I, I miss him a lot. On May 6, 1993, David Bowie announced the untimely death of Mick Ronson. The casual music fan will recognize Mick as the lead guitarist from The Spiders from Mars, but most would be surprised to learn the outsized impact Mick had on rock and roll history, an impact that went far beyond Ziggy Stardust. In 1974, the readers of Cream magazine voted Mick Ronson the number two guitarist in the world, behind only Jimmy Page and ahead of number three, Eric Clapton. But Ronson was so much more than just a guitarist. He was a writer, a singer, an arranger, a producer, and a consummate performer who elevated the work of all those with whom he collaborated. Mick Ronson died at the age of 46, and the mind boggles to think what else he could have accomplished if cancer had not come for him at such an early age. Mick's career, which spanned a quarter of a century, represents the evolution of rock and roll itself. So let's take a look at just a sampling of Mick's creative output, some of which may surprise you. 1970 saw the release of the first David Bowie album to feature Mick Ronson, the man who sold the world. Up until this point, Bowie's music was heavily folk influenced. But the introduction of Mick Ronson gave the music a much more gritty, muscular, rock and roll feel. For the next several years, Bowie's music would be very guitar forward. The title track of the album is a good example of Mick's playing. He created one of the most memorable riffs in rock history, but it's such a simple, melodic little riff that perfectly demonstrates how Mick can make such tasty music that's super memorable, really aggressive, yet not over the top in any way. This album also gives us our first look at what becomes Mick's signature Bowie sound, a sound he most often achieves by playing his Gibson Les Paul through a fuzz pedal and a half-cocked wah pedal. As 1970 came to a close, Elton John released Tumbleweed Connection, but one song in particular was missing from the album. That song was Madman Across the Water, on which Mick Ronson played lead guitar. Not surprisingly for Elton John, Tumbleweed Connection was a very piano-oriented album that had a real honky-tonk feel to it all throughout. So when he recorded a nine-minute version of Madman Across the Water that basically showcased Mick Ronson's soaring electric guitar, it makes sense that that song did not make the cut and it would take decades before the song would actually be released on reissues of the album. One year after Tumbleweed's release, the album Madman Across the Water hit the shelves. The version of Madman that's on this album has a much more subdued guitar line. And in fact, the section that would resemble a guitar solo is actually played by strings. If you go back and listen to the original extended version of this song featuring Mick Ronson, it really sounds more like a live jam in a concert. It's truly a work of art that just wasn't appropriate for the rest of the vibe of the Tumbleweed album. In 1971 came to a close with the release of Bowie's Hunky Dory album. This is considered among David Bowie's best efforts. It really sticks together as a concept album. The themes explored in this album include ambivalence, insecurity, impermanence, artists, their artifice, and their true selves. 
This album also represents the first time the Spiders from Mars get together to back up David Bowie, including Mick Ronson, Trevor Boulder on bass and trumpet, and Mick Woody Woodmansey on drums. And the legendary Rick Wakeman of Yes fame provides the most incredible piano pieces that are the perfect complement for this album. The album also happens to include several radio hits, including Changes, Life on Mars, Queen Bitch, and one of my favorites of all time, Oh You Pretty Things. Bowie's chameleon-like talents really shine through on this album, where he celebrates some of his favorite artists. He sounds exactly like Bob Dylan on Bob Dylan. He sounds exactly like the Velvet Underground and Lou Reed on Queen Bitch. And he sounds exactly like whatever Andy Warhol would be doing if he made a song called Andy Warhol. This album really propelled Bowie into the stratosphere, both commercially and among music critics. And he was the first to admit that it was due in no small part to Mick Ronson. Not only did Mick Ronson play guitar, sing backup vocals, play the Mellotron on this album, but the classically trained musician also took his first shot ever at arranging strings to such beautiful effect, most notably on Life on Mars. Nineteen seventy two saw the lad from Hull in another unlikely collaboration, this time playing guitar and arranging strings for Pure Prairie League on their Bustin' Out album. He also took great inspiration from the band, most notably by taking the song Angel Number no. Nine from this album and making it forever his own. The success of Ziggy Stardust firmly cemented, David Bowie and Lou Reed established a strong mutual admiration. So when Lou set out to cut his second solo album, his team brought in Bowie and Ronson to co-produce. And yet again, Mick proved to be the breakout star of the project, playing lead guitar and piano, arranging strings, and proving essential during the mix sessions. In 1973, Ziggy and the Spiders toured America. And David Bowie, fresh off of working with Lou Reed and Iggy Pop, couldn't help but be inspired by the exciting music coming out of the States. This amalgam of influences that affected the newly minted international rock star who felt the unmooring effects of being on the road became the album Aladdin Sane. Keeping pace with Bowie's musical odyssey across this album, Mick Ronson's guitar also runs the gamut of styles with riffs reminiscent of everyone from B.B. King, Keith Richards, and Brian May. But throughout, Mick maintains his signature sound and feel. The next couple of years saw Mick release his first two solo albums and of course continue his work with Mott the Hoople and Ian Hunter. But for me, Mick's most interesting collaboration of this era came when he joined Bob Dylan's band on the road for the Rolling Thunder Review Tour in 1975. Check out the energy Mick and the others brought to Dylan's music during these shows. And it's a hard rain and a
do now, my blue-eyed son? What'll you do now, my darling young one? Ronson's career took another unlikely turn when in 1982 he was hired by John Cougar to play guitar on the mega-hit album American Fool. True to form, Mick once again found himself becoming much more valuable to the production than his collaborators had expected. As John Cougar told Classic Rock magazine in 2008, I owe Mick Ronson the hit song Jack and Diane. Mick was very instrumental in helping me arrange that song as I'd thrown it on the junk heap. Ronson came down and played on three or four tracks for four or five weeks. All of a sudden for Jack and Diane, Mick said, Johnny, you should put Baby Rattles on there. I thought, what the fuck does put Baby Rattles on the record mean? So he put the percussion on there, and then he sang the part, let it rock, let it roll, as a choir-ish type thing, which had never occurred to me. And that's the part everybody remembers on the song. It was Ronson's idea. In 1992, just a few months after being diagnosed with liver cancer, Mick Ronson produced Your Arsenal, the third studio album from the Smiths former singer Morrissey, one of the biggest solo acts of all time. That Morrissey chose Ronson to produce his album speaks volumes to Mick's status as a legend within the industry. In fact, Morrissey was quoted in print as stating that working with Mick was, quote, the greatest privilege of my life. On April 29, 1993, the music world suffered a terrible loss. Even if millions of fans around the world weren't aware that a man who helped create so much of their favorite music was now gone. Today, a monument stands near the Mick Ronson Memorial Stage in Queens Gardens in his hometown of Hull. Likewise, a guitar sculpture memorial to Ronson can be seen in Hull's East Park, where as a young man, Mick himself used to work as a gardener, now known as the Michael Ronson Garden of Reflection. In addition to his musical contributions to rock history, Mick Ronson was universally loved by all those with whom he worked. No tabloid-style feuds or rows ever arose out of his collaborations with music's biggest names, making his absence all the more painful for those who knew and loved him. I hope this video inspires you to explore the life and career of Mick Ronson, one of rock music's most unsung heroes. Just for one day What you say? 